Hello everyone. I'd like to start out by saying thank you to HBA and have for having us here with the Build Right Conference. It's an honor to be here and I want to jump right in here and talk about this tangled issue of clients and what they want and we're going to talk about these tips of how to help clients understand what they want. Do you ever feel like when you're working with your clients, like you're chasing them and they faint left and you go, but then they zig right? Is that familiar? We're a timber frame company. In the front end, we're really working with builders and architects and clients to help figure out what timbers are going to really hit a sweet spot. And so we really we see the evolution of desires and want lists and the subtraction and the faints left and the faints right. And we've come up with some literature to help clients understand what they want, give them homework in essence. And in fact, it's been so good that we've used it on ourselves in maintaining clarity. And so that's the points we're going to be talking about today. So this kind of reminds me of a gentleman who walked through our doors oh six months ago and I kind of wondered why he came in because he knew what he wanted and just you know give me this yet I was inferring from what he was saying that he wasn't quite seeing around corners yet so during this consultation the information came out and little by little he began to see what's available why maybe his first idea had some flaws in it, some blind spots, and was able to come around and his, his desires went just kind of evolved. And we see this a lot, I'm sure you see it a lot, and you're coaching and guiding your clients. And this is what this presentation is all about. It can be, you can kind of, as your memory hook for this whole thing, just think of your clients, or yourself as a tadpole just wiggling in, just helping your clients wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. And there's a lot of there's a lot of information, there's a lot of choices, and the pieces don't click all at once. It takes a little time, a little massaging, and so we're going to be talking about that. What I'd like to do to start out with is to show you an example of a before and after and really how we help people discover what, they, discover what they want. This is another client, this was four years ago, and this was the before picture. And here's the after. And really, if we look at these, you know, your eyes, there's a lot to see. What is the difference? So back to the before. Now, you'll notice right here, these peaks are all the same level. You'll also notice that if we were to, would have taken the original marching orders, we would have had a small, shallow roof right here at the entry. And you notice here we've got a nice pronounced roof. So how did that happen? And right here, you see the center gable is now higher. So when we're doing work like this, what we're helping clients figure out is what is a sweet spot, what style, maybe sometimes we're talking about curves versus straight, and where do they want to go, and what kind of options they have available to them. And one of the things that's grinding away in the background is what is the impact, what's the overall look and feel, and for the specifics, our expertise is creating a hierarchy of looks that catch your eye. And so by making this donor wider, so that the peak was higher, we just framed some false walls in here. There's a bathroom, this window raised up. We could put a truss here and corbels over here on all sides, and then with this peak raised up, 
it creates a hierarchy. This visual, it really helps out. So that's these makeovers and understanding where that sweet spot is. That's kind of what you might call our claim to fame. So we have 10 surefire steps for you. And steps one through three are some heavy lifters, as well as steps nine and 10. We're gonna take them in order. These ones in the middle, what these ones are, they're, they're not heavy lifters, but the reason they can be so important is they can be starters. For example, in the middle here, there's a step that talks about tones, colors, and textures. And especially for someone who is bombarded by the big picture and can't really see everything, there's so many choices. Sometimes, for example, an interior designer that I know has clients start out with Choose something, she says, gives these marching orders to her clients. She says, choose something in your house that you just really like. It just makes you feel warm on the inside. And in one of her examples, a client brought a pillow that maybe her grandmother made or whatever the backstory was. But so they took a look at this pillow, they looked at textures, they looked at colors, and they started with, okay, you like green. So how do we incorporate green from there? Then it kind of builds the styles and a bigger picture. And so this is, while it's a small detail, sometimes that can be the genesis and the beginning of helping people figure out what they truly want. So this is what we're gonna be doing. We'll go one, two, three, we'll start to do the stars. We'll wind up here at nine and 10. Gathering ideas. So this, uh, with the story that the gentleman that came in and kind of thought he knew what he wanted, this is your, your basic step that you're gonna ask your clients to do. We all do it. Give me your Pinterest account, anything that pictures, magazine covers, uh, you know, give me an idea of where you're starting. And then, that as people do this, they're, they're starting with, okay, here's what I think I want. And that would be really a, a good tagline here. Because when we start to buy a toy, to pursue a hobby, we think we know what we want, but our information at that point is so limited that as we move forward, it's going to change. So that's, that's step number one. And the key here really is listening for clues, listening for clues and, and dissonance, things that don't really resonate. And when you can hear that, then, then, you've, got, then you've got some follow-up questions to start driving for clarity. So starting, this is kind of the basic step, you know, getting, getting a starting point. You know, do you have a picture of what you want in mind? So the next step we'd like to talk about, narrowing your focus. And this one might sound a little bit counterintuitive, but it can really, really help out your clients. It's going to give people another angle, a process of elimination. So we're gonna weed out a lot of things that we just know that we don't wanna look at. Even if they're bright, shiny objects or cool ideas, we just want to really create some guardrails. And so this particular step has a lot of questions like this. For the example, you're saying, what is ugly to me? what really sets my teeth on edge. So in this example, we've got cats versus dogs. Which animal do you dislike the most? And in the example here, we've got two selected as far as cats 
And the why here, the statement goes like this, that I don't hate cats. They catch mice and generally cause less problems than dogs. But I like the loyalty and companionship I feel with dogs. So the yin and the yang, it kind of will launch towards more clarity and maybe what you, somebody wants. So for example, one of these dichotomies that we ask people about is like a rustic factor. We'll ask if we take a look at your whole project and how you want to feel that at the very end, and that's looking at lighting, appliances, flooring, colors, and the timbers are going to have a big impact on this. How rustic do you want it? Looking at the whole thing, the gestalt of it, and if you think that, okay, I want very rustic, we can put you like a tent, like a log cabin, antlers, rusty musket. And on the other side, very clean and modern, we think of hospital. And so we ask people, so where are we on that, on that spectrum? And so that's, that's, they can say, you know, that, well, I really don't want it too rustic. We hear that a lot because even though it's nice, I think I'm going to get tired of it. So then, then they back it off from there. And here's a example here with city and country. You know, which one do you dislike the most? Here's a few more examples. Here's the modern or rustic we talked about. We've got use, lifestyle, We've got investment, and then even to service providers, whoops, handshakes versus a very detailed tight contract. You know, which one do you dislike the most? And that will just launch you right into why you prefer handshakes or signing on the line. That yin and the yang thing makes it easy. So guardrails. This step number two here really is about guardrails, clearing the chaff, and saying here's what we're not going to do. In the context of strategy, it's probably one of the most important questions you can ask yourself. What are we not going to do? And then stick to it. Sounds easy, it's a lot tougher in life. As a business owner, you know this. Preaching to the choir, I am. Okay, so with step one, we talked about gathering ideas, really trying to clarify the starting point. And so what people think they want. You've got pictures, you've, they've shown you different ideas of what they want, and you've listened and asked questions and listens for kind of hollow spots or things that maybe don't add up because the pictures you know that is not built yet and what they really want is yet to be discovered. And so then we've moved to defining ugly and getting guardrails. Let's, let's, okay, so we don't want modern, for example, or farmhouse, or we don't want a huge lodge, you might hear. We hear that a lot. That was step two. And now we're going to refine the, the, the division. What do people really want? And so, so here's some exercises with this step. What you're going to have is exercises you can have your, have your clients do to dig a little deeper and pull on strings and threads and really build this out. One exercise that we have our clients do is we built a style quiz and it's a selection of words and adjectives that tend to align with different styles. And it also is useful in that words that resonate with people, you kind of understand what different words mean to different people and really kind of get in their heads and really try to see what they want. Another thing that this step three has is having your clients ask some of their friends for some adjectives, say three adjectives that describe them, and then maybe ask some of their work companions for three adjectives, and write those down and see if there's some overlap. That can really give some insight into the essence of who they are and how they roll. Make sense? Good. As a builder, you know people really 
put a lot of weight into location. Not so much for us as we just wear a design hat in the front end and we wear a subcontractor hat fabricating and crafting these timbers on the back end. The location many times is kind of decided when builders and clients come to us. But the takeaway here for helping people figure out what they want and make more solid decisions is the location can be a piece that the location can be a piece that dictates to some degree what kind of a style or is going to like say for example if somebody is in a smaller city lot there may be restrictions on what colors they can have what type of roof there may be neighbors in other words they might not want to put a big rustic lodge style of home on a, a smaller city lot for example the, the the cover of this this guide here had those big cedar logs that's not going to fit in in a subdivision right so that can really have a big role in guiding people to what they really want as in just a smarter investment and something that looks at home it might be beautiful in the country but look really bad in the city and there's many aspects location that will affect and dictate and mix into this tangled question of what do I as a client really want so at this point you can really talk to your clients early on about what do they want to see where do they want to live and you can help them build that picture of what they want and what is out of bounds for where they want to build so this segues from location just to like we alluded to what type of building profile style impact is going to give the best beauty that aligns with what your clients want as well as be smart in its investment and blend with the surroundings you know we want to avoid the socks on a rooster syndrome so whether it's tall and angular or sprawled out for a silhouette there's a lot of things that you are going to ask your clients and guide them once the location is fixed then you're going to refine that okay now let's bring this a little to a little finer detail and you're going to bring those guardrails in just a little bit more by silhouette and how it sights to the land and even for example if there's a slope you might be talking a basement but maybe they don't want a basement so you're going to figure out just exactly what works for that property and guide them that way and here again we're zeroing in on helping them figure out what they want and making a good decision right here what we have is country acreage and so an industrial this one here is really long one level kind of an industrial ranch almost like a homestead and that was kind of some of the trigger words that people really wanted in fact I had forgotten to mention in these steps steps number three what we can really get to a lot of times is getting three to seven words that describe the essence of what people want if you can get this out of people you know you and your clients can come back to this short description time after time after time and help with all those decisions that is this a good idea or a bad idea we just have to look at those that that target three to seven adjectives descriptive words and say well does this align with where we want to go or is it detract or is it somewhat neutral 
And from there, it can really simplify decisions. Okay, so atmosphere and lifestyle. Atmosphere really is covered quite a bit at this point. If we've been doing our job, and by the time you're at that point with your clients, you kind of really have a good idea of what they're after. But it's not set in stone. I, we've seen them zig when they should have zagged according to how they were making decisions. But so lifestyle, some people might want just really groove with very, just very smart space, as small of a footprint as possible with quality things around them and just really dialed into exactly what they need. And that you know, blows their skirt up. Other people want to entertain and have a lot of family over. And, and so for these people, maybe a big pavilion out back, a large great room with a big kitchen, sometimes even a pork cashier out front. So traffic, valet traffic can kind of happen. You know, if it's rainy or cold or whatever, snowing. So all that is the lifestyle. That's going to have a, a big impact on helping people figure out what they want and then making decisions accordingly. So the ball of tangled ball of yarn is starting to come unraveled at this point. And we're using these smaller decisions for the smaller knots. So one of the things I like to do in kind of just a conversational way is to ask our clients what's going to be the what do you see yourself doing the most here? And the answers then come out. A lot of times there, there's answers on both sides and so you ask questions it clarify which is more important or what you dislike most. And that's really that, that tangled discussion that wiggles in just for, as in this example, asking what they dislike the most or what they like the most. It's kind of going back to what we started with, but it's just it's this ebb and flow and you, you slowly gain on it. And, and with, by being persistent and keeping our eye on the ball as builders and professionals, you know, we're really helping people get solid investments. So it's really rewarding in that way. And hopefully at this point, you know, we or you with your clients or us with our clients, hopefully we're feeling more confident that we're getting the atmosphere they want along with the lifestyle they want and hopefully the cow doesn't jump the chute at this point. You know, that we've seen it happen but if it does why it just starts all over usually a little quicker the second time. But so anyway that's big value to clients when we can stick with it. So tones, colors and textures like I talked about at the beginning Sometimes it, it starts here. Sometimes the big picture builds off of what is internally just really close. And especially for interior designers, they tend to, guys tend to think big picture and forget the details. And ladies, a lot of times, will zero in on the intimate, how does it feel? And this actually can create a a little bit of discord during the building process because the guy or you know and in most of the building trades were guys and so we we're thinking big picture and not really talking about colors and certain furniture that has to fit certain places and so understanding that these colors and textures and tones are not going to be little decisions that they need some time and they need to be addressed well in advance for the building process to roll forward smoothly when you get there. So many times we're talking about stain colors with our clients. So the timber framing is you know way early in the process, but stain that can be that can be a, a, a question that derails the process because oh a stain color okay yeah well I like this brown well let's see my cabinets. And then I'm going to go slate for my, oh, I better get a slate. And it, 
there, there's a whole myriad of factors that can go into just a stain color that can derail the building process. So this can be used as a start and it can also be used in the start to make the constru construction process really smooth. And one last thing about colors and textures, that does have a pretty big impact on how well it plays with the timbers and with that rustic factor we mentioned. So that is, it's not a small thing and it's really worth handling to closer dial in what is it that you really want. And you don't really have to have a perfect set in stone decision on colors, but if you initiate the conversation and at least have some general directions and get the, get the subconscious and your clients grinding away, because just put that bug in the ear that their brain will spit out the answer, but just address it early. It really help things out. Okay, so timber accessories and in building in general this could be say like cabinet handles or doorknobs or things like this that are going to accentuate the overall look and feel your clients want. So zeroing into what they want and helping them make good decisions. This could be for us as timber framers. This could be whether or not they want to use metal plates on their timber. If they're black or rusted. This could be whether the timbers are rough sawn. It's going to give more of a strength and rustic thing versus maybe a hand hewn or a smooth finish. Just little nuances and touches that will sway the vibe of the, de the design in one direction or another. Just kind of these, sometimes I've likened it unto say an outfit that has got a purse or a necklace or something as an accessory that can kind of change and go this way or that way. So this comes down to material sourcing a little bit. We've got a lot of information on that as well. But in general, the accessories kind of make the outfit. And so this is, the little things make a big difference. So we're still not through the woods, even though the big picture's built up. So that's smaller, that still, okay, now we're really zeroing in what people want, and again, helping them make good decisions. And so when do, when is the best time to ask clients about accessory type of decisions? Of course, there, you're going to be able to read your clients where they're at, if it's going to overload them, then you know, that's not the time to talk about it. And if you're talking about 30,000 foot views in the front, still not a time to talk about it. But if they mention something to in the front end, if they mention something about brushed aluminum or stainless steel or something like this, well, ding! Okay, well, tell me a little bit more about that. So capture that information and maybe you don't push for a decision right then, but you, you've got that information in your back pocket and you're kind of thinking about when will their brain be able to handle this decision and when you spring it on them, you might say, you know, you mentioned your preference for polished aluminum or brushed aluminum and segue into that and it's just a smooth as water off a duck's back the decision can be made and it's good and it's what they want. And another thing, when you can bring up these things they've, they've mentioned from a ways back, they say, wow, this guy really gets what I want and he remembered it and that, that psychological sweet spot of the customer satisfaction, that's going to be a story that is told and retold and retold. You wouldn't believe it. I mean, we're talking about all these details. And Ben remembered that I liked brushed aluminum. And so when we would come down to that, he brought it up and I didn't forget and it didn't cause a problem. And that little tidbit of the story conveys the essence of what you did to help them figure out what they want and make that decision. Okay, fasten up.
buckle your seat belts. This one here, like you know, is huge. You know, hiring decisions, getting a good fit. And I'm going to write it big here. I'll put hiring in quotes because we hire clients, hire clients, right? We're working, if we can work for the right people, and if we can have the right people working with us, man, winner, winner, chicken dinner, almost all the big problems will melt like snow in the sunshine. Really, this is, if there's one thing that I'm passionate about, and one thing that I've made a ton of mistakes with, it's got to be this. So, with this step, there's a lot of little exercises that we've included with this. One of them is to ask yourself as well. I mean, you, you want to know this, and you've probably already done it. But to ask your clients, there's two ways we do this. So one is, well, we can ask our clients that, you know, what type of activities left done or undone, leave them foaming in the mouth and just mad. What type of things just set them off? And so that's going to be touching on core values and, and what they perceive as right in the world and how things should be done. Then the other question to that is what things really just lift them up when they see things done right. For example, an unrelated topic, Les Schwab pretty much had their workers run, move at a, with a good clip, kind of a little dog trot, as in people felt good, like that people care about serving them. And for myself, that's one of those things that make me feel good. When I see people energetic and ready to help, that's, that's, a, that's a thing that's a thumbs up. And so asking clients, what are these things that give them a lift, and what are these things that make them foam in the mouth? Good, good, good information to have. It'll tell you whether or not you should hire these clients, right? And so that's huge. Another question that we've asked is we've asked people to relate a good, good experience they've had with subcontractors or service providers, as well as a bad. And so what this does is it gives the, our clients a chance to explain some of their frustrations, some of their fears, and we really listen to, you know, which story comes first and how much time is spent on either story. If somebody really has a hard time coming up with a good experience, maybe our chances of providing a good experience shrink as well. And it also, then it makes, so when people, when, when we hear, okay, so this is a good experience, so we really want to double down on this particular aspect where you hate surprises. You, you, want, you want good communication. So we're going to double down on the good communication and avoid surprises. And perhaps maybe their bad experience was the choice of bad material and they just really didn't seem to care about craftsmanship or being professional. Well, we make a note of that and we can say, are we the right horse for them to ride? Just give a good, open, honest evaluation of ourselves right then and there. So should we be working for these people? And then it also, also is, is making the person feel like, okay, they get what I want. And, and so we can get a quick evaluation right there. So two things to really get that good fit. There's some more in here, but we got to keep moving along. Okay, I got some notes on here. Big beams on that project. I think this was 20 by 12. Crazy big beams. Okay, so now this brings us to the last step, step 10. And this is really where you've done all this work, you've got all these balls in the air, 
And you're going to take all that and you're going to bring it to the ground in a simple strategy. And there's some steps here that where you put these pieces together for a simple path forward and you as a builder can simplify the, all this to kind of like even a one page document for your clients. Here's where we're at. Here's what we want. Here's some core problems for moving forward. And here's where we're going to go somewhere between here and there. Some like, like we're not going to spend too much on some smaller stuff. We're going to spend big over here and then identify what, what those action steps are. You're going to find a nice door that is really fits their thing and maybe the curb appeal or whatever it is that so all these little steps, you know, those are broken down into action steps. So that, that pulls it all together. You're kind of good to go. You're going to be, of course, modifying as you move forward. And sometimes they're going to come with zany ideas you really think they're not going to like. And you might have to talk them off the shelf and so on and so forth. But as a builder, you know all that. That's your job. So let's move into questions and answers. Some people really want to know about types of wood, kiln dried versus green, what does timber frame engineering require, what do counties ask for, what are the special things you need to look out for with timber framing. Some people want to know about metal plates versus pegs. And so we can get into any questions you might have. And for just kind of a starter warm up, if you would like, I can ask you this trivia question. Back in the day, Builders of old did not have metal connectors, they did not have nails. But when they could get their hands on nails, where did the builders of old use them? When they could get their hands on nails, where did they use them? What did they use the nails for? See in the Q&A. So as kind of a last little point here, if you like this information and want more of it, to subscribe on YouTube that really made me feel good and also that these 10 steps we've we've got this written in a companion guide to the book that we wrote called the art of hybrid timber framing and if you would like these 10 steps kind of as a memory hook to some of the things we covered and, and you can get more information that goes a little deeper send me an email bert b-e-r-t at aerotimber.com you can find us on YouTube by just searching for Arrow Timber Framing.